polysaccharides, specifically how they structure foods, but then also a little bit about the glycemic index and implications in diabetes. And then hopefully, well, for sure, we'll stop about 15 minutes early just to have enough time for the people to grab back their exams. The three people who wrote late, I still don't have them marked. They'll be marked for Thursday. Um, maybe you won't get them back till Tuesday, but the marks for the other three people will be up on Thursday. They're just going through the TAs getting marked now. So today what we're going to specifically look at is two... Of course it stops working right now. Why? There we go. So we're going to talk specifically about two different polysaccharides today. And the reason we picked the two polysaccharides that we picked are because of their applications and their novelty. So first we're going to talk about, again, going back to amylose and amylopectin. So when we talked about amylose and amylopectin previously, we really focused on the difference between the branching rate of amylopectin compared to amylose. So amylopectin has the alpha 1,6. In com or sorry, the alpha-1,4 as well as the alpha-1,6, whereas amylose just has the linear straight change. Now, when we talk about the physical properties, you can imagine a highly branched string of sugars is going to behave very differently than would a branched polysaccharide. So the branched polysaccharides typically are shorter in molecular length, but because they're more branched, they enhance viscosity and they behave very differently when we talk about their physical properties. So when we talk about amylose, specifically it's the alpha-1-4 like, uh, um, alpha bond, and that alpha-1-4 bond is broken down by amylase. What is the smallest structural unit that amylase can break a polysaccharide down into? To maltose, to the two sugar unit. Where is maltose broken down? The brush border. So the brush border is the site where we, <coughs> excuse me, where we go from the disaccharide to the monosaccharide, which can then be absorbed and enter the hepatic portal vein and then go through systemic cir circulation and end up in the liver. So when we talk about amylose versus amylopectin, of course it's not going to work today. All starches are compro comprised of a ratio of amylose to amylopectin. So if you're talking potato starch, corn starch, it doesn't matter. They all can contain a certain amount of amylose and amylopectin. And the functionality is derived by the ratio of these two polysaccharides. So when we talk about starches, they are naturally found in a granule structure, which we're going to look at in the next slide. The physical properties of that gel or of that material is dependent on the type of starch we select. So a tapioca starch versus a corn starch versus a potato starch are all going to have different physical properties. And because of that, they're going to lend themselves to different applications. So if we talk about a starch paste or a bread-like structure or a gluten-free bread product, all of these we have to be able to understand the actual molecular structure of the starch and how it plays a role in structuring. Now, on top of that, and beyond the scope of this course, starches are modified. And they can be modified by the plant, but they can also be modified by industry. And we modify starches to give them different physical attributes that are desirable from a product standpoint. So if we talk about a starch used in one application, it's not going to have the same utility in a different application. <coughs> We're going to talk more about this in food chem and as well in cereal science if you take it. Now, what's important to know is that both amylose and amylopectin are contained within the starch granule. So when you go buy cornstarch, it's a very dry powder. What you're buying are these starch granules. Now, starch granules don't contain a lot of water. They have a little bit of water in it. They have a small amount of fat in that granule, but it's mainly comprised of amylose and amylopectin. And they're contained in highly ordered, highly interacting particles. So if you take cornstarch and you put it in water, what happens? Has anyone ever made a starch paste for a soup? So what do you have to do to get that starch to go into solution? So how do you do that? 
And then what do you typically do after that? You've added it. Now what do you do? Heat it out. <laughs> so when you look at starch in a granule, there's a lot of hydrogen bonding, and that hydrogen bonding is interacting between adjacent starch granules or starch molecules. Now, we talked in water chemistry a little bit about the density of water and ice. Does anyone remember where water is at its highest density? Four degrees Celsius. Four degrees is a magical number when it comes to hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonding is at its strongest at four degrees Celsius. In the case of Van der Waals interactions, it's at its highest at about 40 degrees Celsius. Now, why would there be a difference? It has to do with the mobility of the electrons. So in Van der Waals, you want that electron to rapidly be moving around to create that temporary dipole moment, which then allows for an interaction to take place. In hydrogen bonding, we have that permanent dipole. And that dipole, the strength of that dipole, is dependent on the temperature of the environment that it's in. So just like water, when it's at four degrees, it's most dense. So that's why oceans never freeze, right? Because as that surface water cools, it sinks, and that's why we have ocean currents, is because of the difference in densities associated with hydrogen bonding. So when we have a starch granule at four degrees Celsius, those molecules have very, very strong hydrogen bonds. So to break those hydrogen bonds, we have to heat that granule up. So by heating that up, we decrease the strength of the dipole moment associated with that hydroxyl group. By decreasing the strength of that dipole moment, we weaken the hydrogen bond strength. By weakening that hydrogen bond strength, we weaken the non-covalent interactions that are causing those molecules to interact with each other. Why does that matter? When we want to work with starch, when we want to hydrate it, we need water to be able to imbibe into that crystal structure, further weakening the amylose-amylose interactions, right? We want it to interact with water. We want those starch granules to swell. So when we work with starch chemistry, this is extremely important. So when you're making a paste or a soup at home, you take your starch, you put it in the water, you mix it. You can have a modified starch, so it's cold soluble. Naturally, most starches aren't cold soluble. They've been processed with either a chemical modification or physical modification to be cold soluble. So when we take a natural starch granule and we put it in water, that water has to outcompete the already existent hydrogen bonding between amylose and amylopectin contained within that granule. As you begin to heat it up, those hydrogen bonds begin to weaken. That means the molecules of amylose can begin to move further apart, and that movement apart allows water to imbibe into that crystal. So as that water is imbibing into that crystal, the starch granule begins to swell. And you can think of the starch granule as almost a crystal of starch. So as that starch granule begins to grow and grow and grow, eventually it's going to bump up to the adjacent starch granule beside it. And when that happens, we get the maximum gelation or peak viscosity. So we still have the structure of the granule. So imagine like a water balloon or a balloon, you're blowing it up. The granule is swelling. Eventually they come into contact and then they form a consistent paste or gel. Now, if you continue to heat that system, or if you stir it, what begins to happen? We begin to leach out the amylose out of that starch granule. So the amylose begins to come out of those granules, and that starch gel collapses. So if you've ever made soup at home or something with a starch gel, if you overcook it, or if you put too much shear into it, so you mix it too much, it becomes really sticky. And it doesn't have a good sensory property. That's because you've gone past stage three and are now moving towards stage four. Now, when you get to the bottom of stage four, that means your starch granule no longer exists. You've heated it so much that that native structure no longer exists, and all the amylose and amylopectin have just disintegrated out of that starch granule. So what does that mean? We'll come back to this slide in a second. So do I have to hit a... Okay. So here we have different starch granules. They're in an aqueous solution, and we're heating it. So as you begin to heat, you can see down in the bottom corner, you can already start to see the starch granules 
beginning to become less dense. That means water is inviting those crystals. And you can see that they begin to swell. Now, the degree to which they swell, the temperature at which they start swelling, and the temperature which that structure is completely lost is dependent on two things. One is the size and shape of the original granule, but also on the ratio of your amylose to amylopectin. So depending on the starch you have, you can have heat resistant starches that are unlikely to paste, or you can have ones that undergo pasting relatively easily. So if we go back, go back to here, go back to here, and we'll look at it again. So if we look down at the bottom and look at tapioca starch versus potato starch, right away you should see a very big difference in the starch granule size. Just a sec. Yeah, that's okay. You should also notice a difference when you look at wheat starch compared to tapioca starch, the difference in the starch granule structure. So depending on what you want to use this for, you will be able to select the appropriate starch, obviously beyond the scope of a second year course, but when you start moving into food chemistry in third year, you'll start to understand why would a tapioca starch be favorable comparatively be to a wheat starch? So we have to make decisions based on functionality. So if you watch, the three of these four videos are running pretty close at the same temperature between each one. So you can make inferences about how Here we go again. So again, we're looking at the shape. We're looking at the size of them. Are they restarting? Maybe not. Let's try clicking here. Nope. Okay, I'm going to have to click on them individually for some reason this time. Did I pause them? So potato starch, you can see Bottom corner, you can see the density starting to drop. So now water is starting to imbibe that. As these begin to grow, we can see down here, or well, especially in the wheat starch, how quickly they begin to grow into each other. So once they bump into each other and they have a, created a space filling network, you can imagine that viscosity is going to be much, much higher than in the case of potato starch, where those starch granules never really reach their, when they reach their full size, they don't bump into each other. Now, you can also see that the structure down here in the tapioca starch, we lose that granule structure very quickly, meaning that amylose and amylopectin begins to leach out of that granule. It's going to become a very pasty starch. Now, there's three main stages of setting up structures when we talk about amylose and amylopectin. The first is gelatinization. Gelatinization refers to the swelling of that granule to the point where they imbibe on each other, creating a three-dimensional network and a gel. So that granule is absorbing water. As it absorbs water, it swells, it swells, and then eventually it bumps up to its adjacent um, starch granules and creates a continuous network. Once we start to disintegrate or lose structure of that granule, that's referred to as a pasted gel or a paste. This is very sticky, has a much lower viscosity. Retrogradation occurs when we increase the hydrogen bonding strength and we re-assimilate or we reorder those, those polysaccharides. Now, starch retrogradation happens in a phenomenon all the time if you store bread improperly. So, the question I love to ask is, where do you store your bread? Who stores it on the counter or at room temperature? Who stores it in a refrigerator? Who stores it in the freezer? So there's only two correct answers. The one place you should never, ever, ever store your bread is in the refrigerator. Why is that? It's retrogradation. Where is hydrogen bonding strength that's highest? At four degrees Celsius. What temperature is your fridge? four degrees Celsius. So if you have a, a network that's made up of starch and you put it at four degrees Celsius, those amylose molecules are going to begin to very closely interact. 
It's a phenomenon we refer to as cold staling. The bread will become, will have like gr uh, gritty structure is the best way to describe it. It's kind of, it's almost like it's, got, it's gone stale very, very quick. It becomes kind of tough and brit not brittle, but like trying to, like, what did you call it? <laughs> what was it? Oh. Uh, it's kind of like a gritty structure. It's, it's, it's got a, the surface is a little bit harder than the inside. It's, for, it's a strange structure. Now, we can prevent that by again functionalizing the starch. But again, when we talk about processing of foods, there's not a lot of consumer acceptance to modify, to chemically modify these ingredients to have that kind of functionality. So again, when we talk about retrogradation, retrogradation is highly susceptible when we talk about starches that are high in amylose. Amylopectin doesn't have as high of a tendency to undergo retrogradation. Another really, really important polysaccharide that we talk about is pectin. Who knows where pectin is commonly found? Jam. Now, let me see if I can figure out how to turn this thing on. Okay. Um, home. Doc cam. And I need a light. And... All right, so pectin is a heteropolysaccharide, meaning it has at least two different sugars in it. Don't worry about which sugars it has, but when we make jam, what do you add? Who's made their own home jam before? Anyone in the class? Lots of people, okay. So what do you need to add? Sugar. Sugar is a big one. What else do we need? Fruit, some kind of fruit. And then we either need to add pectin to it or we rely on the fact that the fruit has a natural source of pectin. Typically that's not enough pectin, we add a sachet of pectin. Now, has anyone ever, try, has anyone ever at home tried to make sugar-free jam? Nobody, okay. So, there's sugar jam. So, here are two different jams. Can anyone see differences between these structures? Do they look different? A little bit, eh? Under the camera? The one looks more smooth, the other one looks more rough. So that's one sugar, one sugar free, one sugar, one sugar free, I think. Just move the spoon around. You'll feel a difference in the consistency. By the time the people at the back get it, you won't see as much of a difference because the structure will be broken. Well, we'll start this one here. Thank you. So what's the difference? So pectin, is a heteropolysaccharide, meaning it's comprised of different sugar molecules. Now, one of those sugars has a carboxylic acid on that side functional unit. And carboxylic acids are really important. Why are carboxylic acids important? Remember when we talked about uh, short-chain fatty acids and why they were antimicrobial? Why was it they had antimicrobial qualities? Short-chain fatty acids. Anyone remember? What is the prerequisite for that short chain fatty acid to cross into the cellular membrane, cross through the cellular membrane into a microorganism? It must be associated, must be together, right? Once it moves into the higher pH environment, it dissociates, right? So imagine if you have the sugar containing a carboxylic acid group. If we were at a pH where that was deprotonated, what would that mean? It would carry what charge on it? So we lose a hydrogen, yeah, it carries a negative charge. So now, if we have a whole bunch of pectin in solution, what's going to happen? 
So we have a pectin molecule. It has a whole bunch of negative charge. There's a whole bunch of pectin in there. As those two polysaccharides come together, what's going to happen? We're going to get electrostatic repulsion, right? They're not going to form a continuous three-dimensional network. So sugar jam, or regular jam, and sugar-free jam require different pectins. So pectin in the one jar isn't the same as the pectin in the other jar. So what's the difference? So in pectin, there's always a ratio of the degree of methoxylation. This is a plant-specific process. So whether or not that, carboxylate, that carboxy, carboxylic acid group is methoxylated or not is dependent on the biochemistry of that plant. If it's methoxylated, so if it's that group up in that corner with the MeOCH3, can it deprotonate? The answer is no. It cannot be deprotonated, right? So if it's COOH, that H can come off the hydroxyl group, leaving a negative charge. With OCH3, we don't deprotonate it. So it always remains in a protonated state. So we quantify low methoxypectin and high methoxypectin, or pectin, we classify it based on its degree of methoxylation because its functional properties differ depending on how much of the carboxylic acid groups are methoxylated. And I'll show you why that is. So, depending on the pH of the jam, that group can either be protonated or deprotonated. So, just like we talk about the autoionization of any acid, this is pH dependent, therefore we have a pKa associated it, with it. pKa for most pectins is around 3.5. So above 3 point, at 3.5 we're half protonated, half deprotonated. At a pH above 3.5 we're deprotonated. Below 3.5 we're fully protonated. And that matters when we make jam. So if you're making jam at home, you always use what we refer to as the high methoxypectin. So we take pectin, we put it in solution, it's methoxylated, so now we're not going to get what interaction. So now if all of those groups have their hydrogen ion present, they are not going to undergo electrostatic repulsion, right? But the pectin is so dilute in solution that it only enhances the viscosity. This is much more, sorry, this is the sugar, this is the jam with sugar. If we were to put this amount of pectin with no sugar, with, jam, with, uh, with fruit solids, this would be a liquid. Meaning, there'd be so much water that that water would just fully hydrate the pectin and the pectin would never interact with itself. And that interaction, that pectin-pectin interaction, is what forces or what creates a self-standing gel. Right? Imagine building this room, if these walls weren't interconnected, the roof would fall down on us. It's requiring that these walls are all touching each other for them not to be moving. That's the same concept in a polymer gel. Each polymer represents a wall. The contact points represent kind of the glue that holds everything together in that continuous network. So when we talk about high methoxypectin, the first thing we know is that less than 50% of the groups can be deprotonated, meaning more than 50% contain a methoxy group. That's a positive. The other thing that we work with typically is at a low pH. So in the jam where you're using sugar, when you're, home, when you're creating your jam at home, typically you either add an acidifier to it or you add an acidic fruit. So grapes, strawberries, they're acidic enough that they ensure that the pectin is fully, um, is not dissociated or is not in its ionic form. Why is that important again? If it's ionized, we're going to undergo electrostatic repulsion. If we undergo electrostatic repulsion, those polymer strands aren't going to form that network. They're not going to interact with each other. They're going to remain in solution. So how do we force polymers in solution in a very dilute environment, how do we force them to interact with each other? So I create, so the students in this room represent polymer strands of pectin. How can I force you to hold hands with each other or touch each other? S sounds so inappropriate. <laughs> I can force you all to the back of the room, right, and put you in close proximity. 
How can I do that from a food perspective? How can I force two polymer strands together by not removing water? Pressure, sure. Temperature, yeah, but again, I can't modify the temperature of my jam every time I want it to gel. Concentration. So, I can't change the amount of water that's there. I can't change the amount of pectin that's there. So what do I add to bind water? Sugar. I add a lot of sugar. That sugar forms hydrogen bonds with the water. That pulls that water away from the pectin. That forces pectin to interact with itself, forming the gel. Now, in the jam that you have here, this kind of rough surface one, so again, sorry, we can force that sugar out and then we can form hydrogen bonds between pectin and we get a nice gel. Now, when we don't want sugar present, we have to change the chemistry of the system. So if we want to make a jam that's low in sugar or has no sugar, we have to find another mechanism to force those polymer strands to interact, right? I can't put sugar in to compete and bind the water, so I have to think of something else to do. So what we do is, we use low methoxypectin. And in the case of low methoxypectin, we have very little methoxylation, meaning we have a lot of carboxylic acid groups. Now, if we have carboxylic acid groups, we still would have to force them to interact by hydrogen bonding, which isn't very favorable. So what do we do? If we modify the pH, we can deprotonate that. If we deprotonate that carboxylic acid group, it now has a negative charge. That means it's going to be more soluble in solution, right? Those two polymer strands come into close proximity, they both carry a negative charge, we get electrostatic repulsion. So if we have negatively, negative charges on there, what do we have to add or what can we add to force those molecules to interact? Does anyone have, okay, the students that have the jams, can anyone see a big difference in the ingredients of sugar jam versus sugar-free jam? <laughs> if one has an extra ingredient, what is that ingredient? <laughs> How fast can you read the label? It contains a source of Calcium. Why? What is calcium? A divalent ion, right? That divalent ion can interact with two negative charges. So if we have, there's my crude pectin. There's my other crude pectin. Here's a carboxylic acid group. Here's a carboxylic acid group. If these come into close proximity, they can form a hydrogen bond, right? They can form a cyclic dimer. If this is deprotonated, and this is deprotonated, we get a negative charge, we get a negative charge, we get electrostatic repulsion. If we add calcium, we can form salt bridges. That salt bridge creates a very, very different gel network between those two jam structures. So you can see that this jam with sugar is much, much firmer, right? When you're stirring it, it takes a lot more work to stir the jam that has sugar in it. The gel that's formed with the calcium is much softer. It yields much easier. So even though the structures of those two systems are very different, one relies on sugar to actually create the structure, whereas the other relies on calcium to cross-link it. So instead of now having those dimers of carboxylic acid groups, we now have calcium that's actually interacting with those negative charges and creating that three-dimensional network. I'm going to jump ahead because I want to do this demo. I love doing it. So this is, we'll talk about it in a second, is a very, very similar polysaccharide. So here is something very similar to pectin. It's a derivative from seaweed. It's commonly used in the food industry. Anyone know the 
polysaccharides that we get from seaweed and microbial sources. One's used in chocolate milk all the time, carrageenan. This is an alginate. So alginaic acids are used all the time in the food industry. Very, very safe, commonly found. We usually get it now as, an, as a microbial source. Now, this flows pretty well, right? So here is a calcium solution. You'll notice the viscosities are a little bit different because, again, we've got our alginaic acid in solution. Alginaic acid, again, has that deprotonated carboxylic acid group. So in this case, we have the polysaccharide carrying a negative charge. We get electrostatic repulsion, and we get a fluid, a liquid. It's a viscous liquid, but it's a liquid. Now, if I take, it doesn't matter which is which, I'm going to... I'm going to put the calcium in the beaker. So here's calcium. Here's alginate. So if I take this and I add it dropwise, doesn't really look like anything's happening. I'll do a few more drops. Can anyone see what's happening? Here, we'll do it under here. You won't see anything. It's part of the magic. So again, really doesn't look like anything's happening. We'll make lots of little drops. You know, it still seems like a liquid. It's still flowing pretty good. Maybe it's not working and I'm going to look like a fool. Except I'm not because I've done this a thousand times and I'm so excited. I love playing with alginate. My kids and I love doing this at home. My poor kids are going to grow up to be so weird. <laughs> or so cool. You know, it's really perspective. All right. So here we've got a beaker and it didn't really work. Or did it? So we're going to take out the garbage. We're going to pour it into my hand. And you can see now, we have little tiny beads, right? They're almost the same size. Well, they are the same size. Whoa, this is tricky. See it? It's the exact same size and shape as that droplet. See? You can kind of see them all down the hand. So this is a process called spherification. Really popular in a whole field of avant-garde molecular gastronomy. There's other really cool things we can do with it too though. So if I take my calcium chloride bath. So this process we call spherification used to create fake caviar. So it keeps that nice sphere shape, but it's now you can have like a peach caviar. Have, we make them all the time in, again, avant-garde molecular gastronomy. So here we have a teaspoon. <laughs> this poor prof, whoever teaches after me. So here we go. So we have a spoonful of alginate. We're submerging it. One, two, three, four. I could have probably taken it out instantaneously. Go over the garbage. That sucked. Try again. <laughs> I'm just going to leave it for a second. So this negative charge, this calcium in solution is moving now, is diffusing into that other solution. And as that calcium is migrating in there, if it's got that negative charge, it's forming that divalent salt bridge, and then it forms a continuous network. And here we go. This is going to be, oh, I just lost it. Is that it? There we go. So now, we get something that kind of looks, well, it's cool. And if we do my last final thing, so here we have, I forget if this is, this is calcium chloride. I'm going to just take my, dump a little bit of that out. Dump in my alginate. Give it a second. 
and you can see the process is pretty much instantaneous. What's really cool about this now, what they're looking at is, man I'm messy, <laughs> is if you do it right you can create, and you can see one here, fairly large pockets of water. So imagine you're running in the Boston Marathon and instead of getting handed a cup of water you get, held, you get handed an alginate bomb. This is just calcium and water in the middle of an alginate. Seaweed. It's completely edible. I'm not going to eat it. It's pretty gross with no flavor in it. But you can see, here's a really nice one. Again, making a huge mess. Ah, oh, it broke. But you can see the nice little sac that it creates. So you can imagine if you had, my hands are going to be like this for the rest of class. This is disgusting. But, ah. Oh. <laughs> But you can see in principle how you could make a, yeah. So I don't, I don't know specifically the Gatorade ones. I've never seen them. Um, I know that there's a ton of work. This sucks. So bad. I want to use that person's jacket, whoever left it. <laughs> Probably would not be appropriate, especially since we're filming. <laughs> um, you, someone has, oh yes, please. I didn't think that one all the way through. Yeah, edit it out. <laughs> Sorry? You could, like you could use it as that. Um, anyone know where alginates are really commonly used in the food industry? There's a specific thing, it's hard not to give away. It's red. Jello, no. Jello is gelatin. The pimento of an olive. Yeah, that little red thing that's curled. Do you notice how it's so perfectly uniform? What they basically do is take red pepper, create a liquid smoothie basically of it, add alginate, and then put it into a calcium bath and create that nice kind of pimento. The longer we leave it, actually we'll do it again. <laughs> because I just like playing. See here, oh here's a nice little one. So you can imagine you could bite into that and drink the fluid if it was bigger. But what's cool about it, is as we leave this, and if we change the concentration of calcium, so if I leave this for a few minutes, we'll notice more calcium moves into that alginate. If more calcium is moving into that network, there's more salt bridges created. The more salt bridges that are created, the more solid-like that becomes. So in the case of a pimento, they leave that in the calcium bath for a long time. Now, the challenge with using this is that... The person walking out just distracted me. Oh, yes. Is that most soluble forms of calcium have a really na uh, like a like a very strong soapy taste. Like calcium has a soapy taste. So we use different calcium, calcium carbonate versus calcium chloride. The problem is calcium carbonate doesn't have the taste, but it doesn't solubilize well. So you have to leave it exposed for a much longer period of time. So you can see as I make a big mess, you can see you can change the size, the shape of that if I break it up. More calcium is going to be interacting. I forgot. I didn't. Oh, my hands. Oh, that jacket's so appealing. <laughs> Hopefully that was the same napkin I put in. <laughs> you laugh. I'm thinking about it seriously. Like, ugh. home, laptop. All right. So when we talk about polysaccharides, there's a ton of applications that pectin plays a very, very important role in creating a structure that plays an important role in structuring foods. There's applications, though, where these polysaccharides are detrimental. And I'll give you an example. If you buy orange juice, and if you go to the supermarket and you look at any example of orange juice, almost all orange juice is pasteurized, right? Why do we pasteurize orange juice? Is the risk of pathogenesis very high in orange juice? pH is really low, right? So the pH is going to keep it pretty stable. There's lots of sugar in it. So the likelihood of some kind of spoilage happening isn't that high, especially if we're keeping it refrigerated. 
why we pasteurize orange juice is if you go into the grocery store and you pick up a bottle of orange juice, the bottom one third has like a solid precipitate into it, right? Pectin and pectin enzymes, well, pectin enzymes begin to break down the pectin. Why do we need pectin in orange juice? Why don't we just get rid of it? So where does the flavor of orange juice come from? What molecules consist of the flavor components of an orange juice? So there's things like limonene present. Limonene is kind of the cleaner taste. So if you, if you buy really inexpensive, you know, a dollar of orange juice frozen can for a dollar, you notice it doesn't taste like fresh squeezed orange juice. They're relying on limonene to, to give it that flavor. Limonene is when you buy your orange uh, scented house cleaner, that's limonene. Really high concentrations in the peel. What gives orange juice its characteristic flavor? Someone said it. What? Oranges? Yes. Very insightful. So what is it in the orange that's giving the juice the flavor, cons the flavor profile? It's the fat. It's the oil, right? The essential oils are what give it that characteristic aroma, that really nice orange flavor is fat. If we mix fat or oil and water, what happens? It separates, right? Your salad dressing at home separates. Pectin allows that emulsion to stay present. If we begin to degrade the pectin, we destabilize what we call a colloid. Orange juice is a colloid. So in some cases, pectin we need to protect. Now, when we, do, when we juice an orange, we want to get rid of that pectin, right? Because that pectin is binding water. We want to get all that liquid out when we create a juice. So if we create certain juices, sometimes we treat it with a pectin esterase to break it down so we can get more juice extraction. There's also times we want to thermally process a product, and it's called a hot break process, to preserve the quality or the thickness of a product. Characteristics, tomato-based product, salsa, ketchup. If you don't thermally process those in a few days to weeks, that ketchup, which is very viscous, right? You invert a bottle of ketchup before the squeeze bottle. You'd have to sit there and you'd have to bang on the end of it, right? You guys are probably all too young to remember glass bottled ketchup, right? Ketchup is remarkable. You don't understand. This is where I get so, what's the word I'm trying to find? I find frustrating teaching because this is something that's so remarkable. In science, we're, we're so fixated on things that really, I shouldn't say don't matter, but what the temperature of a supernova is a billion miles away really makes no difference to my daily life. Pectin plays a role in every culin culinary experience you have. Not every experience, but think about ketchup. When you take your glass bottle of ketchup, so first, a funny story. When I was about 10, 12 years old, I re distinctly remember ketchup moving from a glass bottle to a plastic bottle. And the big advantage of using a plastic bottle is you can squeeze it and it begins to flow. Right? In a glass bottle ke of ketchup, you have to turn it upside down. Now, when you turn that glass bottle upside down, that ketchup doesn't begin to flow. You hit it once. That's, a, that's sheer you're putting into it. You're mixing it. You're stirring it. Same thing. You hit it once, it doesn't flow. You hit it harder, it doesn't flow. You hit it the same amount over and over and over again. In time, in repetition, that fluid begins to thin. So it's a sheer thinning phenomenon. Now, why is that important? So you're banging the bottle. Again, sounds really inappropriate. You're taking that bottle and you're hitting it. You're hitting that bottle, you're hitting that bottle, it begins to flow. It goes from a solid to a liquid, right? Now, you stop banging on that bottle, that ketchup is now on your french fry, it stops flowing. It's behaving more like a solid. So now instead of putting, when you put ketchup on your french fry, it doesn't just flow around your french fry and flow onto the plate, it stays on your french fry. The science that does that is absolutely phenomenal. So if you take Heinz ketchup and you take that bottle and you turn it over and you're the first to use it in a while, what happens? 
you get that crappy little bit of ketchup that if you've squirted on your hamburger and your french fries, you're disappointed. And it's that cinerese type fluid that's kind of diluted ketchupy water, right? There's been millions of dollars spent on designing not only how to prevent that, but also on designing a squeezable bottle that replaced the glass bottle. You guys are far too young to remember the controversy centered around whether or not people would buy Heinz ketchup in a glass bottle or in a plastic bottle. I remember as a kid going into a diner and seeing a plastic bottle and being so disappointed that it wasn't the glass bottle. And I know it seems weird and everyone's kind of like laughing at me because I was disappointed over my ketchup, but it just, like, you make quality assessments without even knowing you're making quality assessments. So if every time you turned your ketchup upside down, it just flowed and it didn't coat your, your french fries, you wouldn't buy that product again. You can buy inexpensive ketchups that do that all the time. So we don't even know we're making decisions based on the science of those products. Anyhow, back to food. So, if you look at pectin again, and the ability of that molecule to form structures, in the case of orange juice, you can see that settling. And again, we get around it by pasteurizing orange juice. Now, why would you not want to pasteurize orange juice? Everyone should have their hand up with an answer here. If you don't, I'm going to cry. I'm not really going to cry. Nobody? What is the downfall? Why would you not want to pasteurize orange juice. Yeah. Loss of vitamins. So we're going to see thermal degradation, just like we saw in any thermal processing unit, right? When you apply heat, you degrade nutrients. So you're going to see a loss in the nutritional profile. In orange juice, that's pretty important, right? You talk about orange juice, you want to talk about the vitamin C and the vitamin profile it has. It's important that you don't overly process it. So loss of vitamins. Why else? Yeah. Taste. So there's two different attributes when we talk about the taste of orange juice. The first being the fact about the essential oils. Essential oils are extremely volatile, right? When you open the cap of your orange juice, what do you smell? Oranges. Those volatile organic acids are very easy to go into the gaseous phase. You put that under heat, you're going to smell oranges very quickly. After you've let it cool, you're not going to taste the orange, that same essence in that orange juice. What else is happening? What is, yeah? Color. Change the color. And why is the color changing? Mailard or caramelization is happening, right? You've got lots of sugars in there. So you get a browning of the orange juice. And it's enough to detect significant changes. So if we look at two different studies I pulled up, we have fresh orange juice, we have lightly pasteurized and heavily pasteurized. Really, there's no such thing as lightly pasteurized orange juice. They just wanted to show an effective treatment on the effective quality. And these are mean hedonic flavor, score, hedonic flavor scores. This is how much they're liked. So if I gave everyone a glass of orange juice, or three glasses of orange juice, and I asked you to rate on a scale of, I forget what the scale, and one, you don't like it, nine, you like it a lot, we would be able to see statistically significant differences in how much you like your orange juice depending on how long that thermal treatment and how high of a temperature that thermal treatment went to. So your palate is sensitive enough to determine whether or not Maillard reaction has happened. Whether or not we've lost essential oils during that heating process. So the first is, yes, pasteurization is significant enough to change the sensory attribute, changing the mean score of how much you like that product or not. You can see it drops from about a 7 down to about a 6. Again, that's enough for it to be a statistical significance. Now, if we look at inhibition of oxidation. Now, we're going to take a little bit of a leap of faith because we haven't talked about oxidation yet. But oxidation, remember, is the generation of a free radical. And that free radical creates other free radicals and we get this whole propagation reaction. How do we sequester free radicals? How do we stop them? from propagating. What do we add? Why? What do we, how do we prevent oxidation? We add a antioxidant. What's a good antioxidant in oranges? Why do we drink orange juice? Vitamin C. Vitamin C is a good antioxidant. 
Now, instead of measuring the amount of vitamin C, because again, remember, when we heat something, we're not removing vitamin C. The vitamin C is still there. We've just changed somehow its chemical structure. We've broken a double bond, or we've shifted its resonance structure, so that double bond is in a different place. So by changing the chemical structure of that vitamin C, it changes how it's able to interact with free radicals. Remember, the whole reason why you drink red wine is because you want resveratrol, and that resveratrol is an antioxidant. It sequesters free radicals. The whole theory of aging is based on free radicals. So, if we have our blank or a not treated juice, we can see that we get an inhibition of 85. Again, that 85% really doesn't mean anything. It's not important. What we're looking at is the relative value in response to the specific treatments we've applied to that orange juice. We can see, with no treatment, we get about an 85% reduction in the propagation of oxidation. In a, in a pasteurized, that drops down by 2%. So right away, we've somehow changed the biological availability or the bioaccessibility of that micronutrient by 5%, 3-4%. Again, may seem insignificant, but if you chronically consume thermally treated foods, you are chronically getting less bioavailable, bioaccessible micro micronutrients that are not available to partake in whatever biological function that they may be consumed for. So again, that 4% insignificant in a single glass of orange juice, but in a single glass of orange juice, 365 days a year for 65 years, times that by the other contributing factors of every other food we eat that is processed, all of a sudden we are consuming 4% less micronutrients based simply on whether or not that system's been thermally processed. So why do we do it? Well, one is it produces a good quality product, pretty inexpensively, so we can do thermal processing without much added cost. But we can get around it. We can deactivate enzymes without applying heat. So in really high-end applications, we use extremely high amounts of pressure. So remember, when we talk about an enzyme, an enzyme will talk about the ternary and quaternary structure of a protein. So remember, when we talked about that, uh, that um, catalytic triad, those amino acids weren't adjacent to each other on that amino acid backbone, or that peptide backbone, right? So that means, for that triad to be in close proximity in that catalytic site, that protein has to undergo a very, very specific conformational adaptation, meaning it's got to fold in such a way that those three amino acids are in a very close proximity. So they can interact with that one carbonyl or that one bond that we're trying to break. So that ternary structure of that protein is extremely, extremely important. Imagine a sponge. A sponge is like a protein. That protein adapts a very specific configuration. When you put it under pressure, you squeeze that sponge. That catalytic triad moves. All of a sudden, if you can move that structure, that quaternary structure, or that ternary or quaternary structure, by applying really high amounts of pressure, you can change that structure of that protein. If you can change the structure of that protein enough that you alter the catalytic site, the enzymatic activity drops down to zero. So you can see that as you add pressure, you can see that the pectin methylesterase begins to draw the activity until you get to about 600 pascals, megapascals. So we're talking enormous amounts of pressure. We're talking at the bottom of uh, what's that Marianas Trench or whatever in the ocean. We're talking two elephants standing on a dime. That amount of pressure to give you to put it into relation. Now. It's very expensive to do. It's a very expensive piece of equipment. Why? Under those amounts of pressures, if, you, if that machine fails, meaning it cracks or it breaks, it explodes. It'll shoot a screw through a two-foot concrete wall, no problem. It's like a missile. So the design of these instruments, one, are very, very precise, very, very expensive. Very difficult to make it a continuous process, right? Because you're applying pressure. How do you make that how do you apply pressure if you have two open ends? So food's going in and out, you have to have something that closes down so the pressure can be added. So when we talk about applications with HPP, 
you're not going to buy a $12, $13 bottle of orange juice, like a family size bottle, not an individual ser serving, compared to a bottle of orange juice that you can heat pasteurized for $7. So where does things like HPP get a lot of um, good applications? Imagine making some kind of paste that you want to preser preserve the nutritional quality. Things like avocado pastes, fruit pastes, and where you really, really want to be sensitive to the chemical reactions associated with heating. So if you've ever heated an avocado, the structure gets pretty gross pretty quick. Same with oysters, if you overcook them, they become really mushy. So you can change or you can, mod you can eliminate that need for heat by using pressure. This is true for anything. If you want to sterilize a food product, you can use pressure. The problem is cost and time. So everything has a balance that we have to weigh. So when we talk about polysaccharides, pectin and alginates are two very, very specific ones. There are hundreds of really unique functional polysaccharides that have very niche applications. Again, chocolate milk and carrageenan. Take out that carrageenan, you're going to have milk, white milk, with chocolate on the bottom. You need that carrageenan to suspend the cocoa solids to actually have chocolate milk. You need them to stabilize casein micelles. So all down this side are all different, very important polysaccharides that have very unique physical properties and very unique applications. Way beyond the scope of this course. But what's interesting about alginate is that gelation is instantaneous. So if we look at this now that's been sitting here, and as I spill it as I walk over, you'll see now the structure of this is much, much different. Remember I was picking it up before and it was breaking? I can now throw it, a, and of course it broke. But you can see that the structure is much harder. Grab another one. Whoop. You can see, see how it's become opaque. It's starting to become opaque a little bit. It's coming, becoming a little bit cloudy. That's because the calcium is making that network structure stronger and stronger. So we can change the application depending on the duration to which it's exposed in that calcium solution. So again, all kinds of really cool applications. Harvard did a lecture series that talked a lot about polysaccharides. Really, really entertaining. Really well done. Um, lectures that you can watch on YouTube if you're interested. Okay. So when we talk about polysaccharides, not sweetness. They don't provide a flavor profile. We typically don't talk about them from a color perspective. They can partake very minorly in Maillard reaction. Remember, every amylose molecule has one reducing sugar on the one end. But again, not significant in color. So it doesn't partake in Maillard. It'll play some role in binding water, so it has a little bit of a role in water activity. Has a huge role in freeze concentration. If you look at your ice cream label, you're always going to see different polysaccharides that are being added to structure that. And they can produce glasses. The one thing we haven't talked about, and a perfect place to stop to hand back the midterm, is on Thursday, we're going to transition into what does all this mean from a biological nutritional profile perspective, which we will talk about. So 